jump right into it here, but, but I really want us to grasp that, that what we get to have right here, right now, is priceless. I mean, think about it. You get to put your life on hold for right now, and hopefully we can all do that. Hopefully you can not be looking at your phone right now. Hopefully you're not really caring how many likes you have on Facebook right now, or how many views you got on your IG post this morning, or whatever you're doing. Hopefully none of that stuff matters right now, and hopefully your heart can be at rest, and you could just focus in for the next half hour as we look into the Word of God. Because the Word of God is so powerful. This will, this will change your life if you let it. There, there's a, there's a, a heart of God that wants to come out and get inside of you if, if you're willing to let it in a moment. The Word of God can change your life in, in 10 seconds. You could read something in here that that gets you to make a decision when, you're, when your heart's tender and your mind's connected. It can, it can make you make a decision that will change the rest of your life. But you've got to be the one who decides to let that happen. You know, the Bible says it's living and active. You know, if there's a lion in this room, prowling the front part of the room, what do you think that would produce inside of you? It would make you want to do something. It would make you consider what, what you're doing right now. But if there was a, a rug that was made out of a lion on the floor right here, you probably wouldn't even skip a beat in your heart because it's dead. You see, when something's living and active, it gets you to move. It gets you to think. It gets you to act. It gets you to change. And this, this word right here is alive and it is active. The Bible will hit you exactly where and how it's supposed to hit you because it's delivered from the mouth of God. And when you let the Bible do what it's supposed to do, God will help you become the man or the woman that you were made to become. I believe the Bible prompts us to become different. Let's open our Bibles to Romans chapter 10. You know, today we're going to talk about faith. We got some faith in the room today? Well, however much faith we have in here, it's about to get more faithful in this room. Because we're about to get the word of God more into this room. And when you get the word of God in any situation, it can change. We're going to talk about faith, where it comes from, how it works, how you can have it. Because have you ever looked at somebody and said, well, man, they're just more faithful. That's why it works out for them. I wish I could have the faith that they have. Well, I'm here today to tell you that you can have the faith of God as we read the Bible. And here in Romans chapter 10 and verse 17... God's got all these one-liners that just move you in a great way. And here in Romans 10, verse 17, it says, Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message. And the message is heard through the word of Christ. You know, it's amazing when you look at the Bible. Where does faith come from, from a biblical perspective? God tells us. It's not some mystic thing that you got to go out to the ocean and wonder about, or you got to go get lost in the forest, and, and hopefully some sort of dust is going to fall down, and, and something's going to click, and then everything's going to change, and then life is going to be good. No, faith comes as a consequence of you hearing and accepting the message that you see in the scriptures. And the Bible says right here that as you study the scriptures, you get exposed to faith. Now, you ever heard something, but it didn't really impact you? You ever been to a, a church service or been to some sort of a, a Christian meeting, and, and you come in, the one person, and you leave the same person? It's like that thing never happened. Well, what happened was you got exposed to faith, but it didn't really sink inside of you, so it didn't really change you. And so this morning, we're going to all get exposed to faith because the Word of God's going to be read. But it's up to you if you're going to absorb it. If you're going to be able to put the other things on hold, you're going to throw off anything else that hinders right now. And as we look into the scriptures, you're going to let it hit you in the heart. You're going to let it soak into your mind. You're going to let it get into the depths of your pores of your soul. And you can leave today a changed man or a changed woman with a new dedication to God, a commitment to studying his word, people in your life who are going to help you, and you can walk out here ready to make a great impact for our great God. You know, sadly, in our day and age, the Bible hasn't become a priority. And so many people grow up in church, and they feel like because they've been exposed to faith, 
They already have that. They've been there. They've done that. But I got to ask you today, have you ever personally studied the Bible? Have you ever had some people in your life to sit down and, and help get the scriptures inside of you? And you take your life versus what the Bible says and, and really try to reconcile those two things. Because I know for me, I lived a long time being exposed to the word of God, but living a totally different life than what the Bible said. And it wasn't until some, God put some people in my life that we sat down and, and we started doing some Bible studies. And it was really the first time that I really looked at who I really was and what the Bible really said. And I, I really worked to get those two things on the same page. And I had to go through a, a, a humbling process to realize that it wasn't the scriptures who were gonna that was going to change. So who needed a change? I needed a change. And the truth is, we can be exposed to stuff our whole lives and never be impacted by it. But I believe we're here today because we want to be impacted by the Word of God. We want to leave faithful men and women. And we don't want today just to disappear and Monday come and you get a case of the Mondays and just focus on your work. We want today to follow into Monday, to follow into Tuesday, to Bible studies on Wednesday, throughout the whole week so that we can live a lifestyle of a great faith. But the question I have today is how faithful do you want to be? The world's getting darker and darker. The sin is getting greater and greater in our world. And so that means that we need men and women to rise up to have more faith than we've ever had before. If you're riding a, if you're coasting on the faith that you had five, five years ago or five days ago or from somebody else, what's going to happen is as darkness increases, your faith might start to decrease. How faithful do you want to be? You see, if there's an absence of the word of God in your life, there's going to be an absence of faith in your life. But when there's a continual presence, when the Bible's a priority, when faithful men and women in your life is a priority because they're going to lead you back to the Bible, what's going to happen is your faith is going to grow. You're going to be able to stand up to the dark things of this world, and you and me are going to change many, many lives. But we need to realize that faith is delicate. Faith is so important. Faith is powerful, but it's delicate. It must be protected. And in a fallen world where sin is rampant and, and sin desires to have each and every one of us, it's up to us to fight for our faith, to protect our faith, to hold on to one another with our faith, to inspire one another, and to encourage one another to never give up on this great fight. And the title of our lesson this morning is The Fight of Faith. Let's go over to Matthew chapter 4. The fight of faith. You know, I appreciate Tim was sharing one time, and uh, Tim's got all these great sayings, and you don't really realize how much you absorb from somebody until you're around them for a while. And uh, I've been able to be uh, under Tim's direct mentorship going on five years now. And uh, man, I, I speak so much of the things Tim says, and I, I think so much the way Tim thinks now, and uh, I just appreciate that. And uh, Tim shared an example, and uh, there was a, I didn't write it down, but it's, it's on my heart, so I'm going to share it. Uh, there was a, a situation where two people stepped into a conversation, and he said, well, I didn't know we were in a fight. And he says, well, that's exactly why you're losing. And I think what happens is we can step into Christianity and because we've seen baby Jesus at Christmas time, because that's the only time some people go to church, or because we think of Easter Bunny Jesus because some people only go to church on Easter, or we think of Sunday school Jesus because that was the only time that somebody was committed was when they were in Sunday school. What can happen is you cannot, you cannot realize that this is a fight. That actually Jesus came as a warrior. You know the Bible says God is a warrior? God had to lead the exodus through Moses out of slavery through the, de through the Red Sea into the desert for 40 years where they fought just to get to Canaan where they fought more battles. And then we step in and we say, well, we're in the 21st century and man, churches are filled with great buildings and great cups of coffee and great donuts and let's just kind of settle down and, and, and Christianity is a, a bunch of nice people that get together and smile at each other. But if you just read the Bible for, for 10 minutes, you're going to find out that the Bible says that if you're going to come follow Jesus, you're going to become a warrior as well. You're going to enter a fight. And yes, it's for men and women. And man, we fight together. And yes, we've got different roles. But it's amazing as we come together as a church, as warriors in the battle of the faith. Matthew chapter 4 and verse 14. 
I'm sorry, in verse 18. It says, as Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and the, his other brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father Zebedee, preparing their nets. Jesus called them, and immediately they left the boat and their fathers and followed him. Jesus went through Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness among the people. You know, here was the initial call of, of really following Jesus. And Jesus came across, and, and he knew that he had just been 40 days in the desert, fighting temptation. It said the wild animals were there. The angels were attending him. Heaven opened up right after he got baptized. Jesus, God said, you're my son. I'm well pleased with you. He went straight into the battle. And Jesus knew what I got to do is I got to go get other people to come into the battle. And he pulled in these two brothers. He pulled in these other two brothers. And he says, guys, come follow me. And I'm going to make you fishers of men. You see, this was the initial call of somebody who would follow Jesus. And what Jesus was inviting them to was not just a, a simple service. Jesus was inviting them to the adventure of their lifetime. That's what Christianity is. That's what you and me get to be a part of. That Jesus says, if you're going to come follow me, you're going to not only have fellowship with me, you're not only going to learn the things that I want to teach you. Yeah, we're going to have some awesome times together. And yeah, we're going to make some awesome memories. But man, we're going to go out and we're going to fish for people. We're going to get in the spiritual battle. We're going to deal with situations and hardship and demons and it's going to be preaching and we're going to have to heal people and we're going to have to deal with life issues and man it's going to be a battle but you know what we're going to be battle buddies and we're going to be closer because of it and we're going to go change the world together and so my first point today is who you are today is really who you are I lived a lot of my life just thinking of who I would be in the future and it deceived me for who I really was today. I meet a lot of people, and as we study the Bible with people, we say, hey, well, what's your purpose in life? And they say, well, I believe God's called me to preach the word. Or I believe God's called me to help the poor. And, and I'm like, man, that's awesome. How's it going? Yeah. Well, right now I'm in school, and, um, and then I'll get a job. And then, you know, as I get financially stable, then I'll do those things, because that's my ultimate purpose. Man, who, you, who are you today? I mean, these guys, who were they today? One day they were fishermen. They were just on their boats. They were religious guys. They worked hard. They believed in great core values, I'm sure. And then, and then all of a sudden, Jesus got into their life. And that day, they became different people. One call. It's like, guys, come follow me. Oh, my goodness. I can follow Jesus? Sometimes we read the Bible and we think, man, how can I really follow that? You know why it's so hard to believe some of the things in the Bible at times for your life personally? Because we look through a lens of, of tampered sin. We look through a lens of people who've been impure before, people who have lied before. When I first studied the Bible, I was looking at the Bible, trying to interrogate the Bible because I didn't want to change my life. You ever been that prideful like me before, where like you look at the Bible, you're like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to find the contradiction in here. And you try to, like, interrogate God, and I believe God's just up there like, oh, this has survived civilizations, this has survived kings and overthrows, this has survived cultures and hurricanes, I mean, this has survived everything. You look at a lion, and, a, like, if you look at a lion and a human, like, a, a human is like, we think we're so tough, but, like, with a lot, we're like paper mache, you like, we're like a little piece of, like, a paper to a lion, you know, a lion would just go whoosh. And just not even think about it. Go on and just take a nap and go do it over and over again. And then, and then but sometimes we look at God and we're like, creator of the universe, I'll show you. Give me this Bible. I'm going to find the, the issues in this thing. And then, and then we try to understand this from an imperfect perspective because we're all imperfect. And then we can, st we can feel like, all we, all we want to do is be so prideful not to change. It's like looking at something through a broken glass. 
That's our best effort on our own. We're looking through, you're driving down the, the 35 with a broken windshield saying what's true and what's not true. You can't really see. You're hoping things will work out, but how do you really know? You don't really know. And so the Bible is written, we got to realize this is from God's perspective. Never experienced sin before. You know, this was written from, from the Holy Spirit that has never fellowshiped with sin before. The only thing that God knows is purity. That's all that God knows. God just knows that purity is good and truth is good and faithfulness is go good. God knows how everything was created. He looks at your heart. He looks at my, God knows everything. And God's like, this is the right answer. And we can come to, to look at this and we can start to be a little bit judgmental where we don't interrogate the Bible. The Bible's supposed to interrogate us and get us to change things and realize who we are, and we can change in a day, guys. Maybe you're here today, and this is your first time coming out to church, or maybe you're here, and you've been here for a while, and you say, man, I don't know if I can change. You don't know. You don't know what I've been through. Well, God knows what you've been through, and God wants you to be one of his disciples. He wants you to be a son and daughter of his. He wants you to make decisions from his word that he's going to look down, and when he sees you seeking him with all his heart, He's going to come seek you and he's going to strengthen you as you get committed to him and you make God and his word a priority in your life. So my question is, who are you today? Are you somebody who's eager to respond to the scriptures? Because when you are, God will begin to move in your life very, very quickly. Well, let's go over to 2 Timothy chapter 4. We're talking about the fight of faith. You know, I'm sure that they were there on the boat and they were like, should we follow him? Should we stay on the boat? Because I know if we stay on the boat, we know what tomorrow's going to look like. We know what today's going to look like. We're good, right? It won't really disturb our life. And, and, and this could just be a, a passing thing that happens that we brush off. We just go about our merry way. But they were willing to let God get into their life and change them, even though they, they didn't know what that meant. And maybe you're here today and you're like, man, I already know what I'm doing. I'm here for college. I'm going to go to school. I'm going to become an engineer. I'm going to become a movie star. I'm going to become a doctor. That's all set up. I'm like, man, it's your first year. You, don't, you have no idea what could happen. <laughs> but if you get linked up to the creator, the creator is going to open up your mind. And creator is going to give you wisdom. And God's going to give you strength and, and insight to know that what, who the man God or woman God wants you to be. And you can respond. And then you can go down that incredible path. Look here at 2 Timothy chapter 4. We looked at people who just started off that they responded quickly. Let's look at somebody who had lived 30 years faithfully following Jesus. It says here in verse 6, he says, for I'm already being poured out like a drink offering and the time has come for my departure. I have fought the good fight. I finished the race. I've kept the faith. Now there's in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Do your best to come to me quickly. You know, it's amazing. You got the initial call of people who were going to come follow Jesus. And they had to decide who they were going to be on that day. And on that day, they became people who responded quickly to Jesus. They responded by faith. They said, I don't know what this is going to look like, but I'm going to go on this adventure with Jesus. And if you're here today, I want to encourage you to get on this adventure with Jesus. And then here's somebody who 30 years into his Christianity looks back and he said, man, it's been an awesome adventure with Jesus. Who do you want to be when it's all said and done when you look back on your life? Do you want to say, man, I built a great career and, and man, I really missed opportunities on, on, you know, this and that situation. I really missed the opportunity to be faithful, but man, I made a lot of money and I had a great retirement now. I, I made a lot of bad decisions along the way, and man, some of those dark things still follow me this day, but I don't want to be that guy. Do you want to be that guy or that girl? I want you to vision your life 30 years from now. Envision yourself at the end of your life. What do you want to say about your life? Paul looked at his life, and he says, man, I fought the good fight. I kept the faith. I'm here. I'm finishing the race. It's a reality. I went through the hardships. I went through the challenges, but man, I never gave up. And here Paul is all alone. And now his advice to his young protege is, guys, do your best. And I believe that's the advice that, that we got to have today is do your best. Do your best to, to make every effort to study the Bible. Do your best to build a life of faithfulness and a, 
and a life that where you say, man, I've looked at the scriptures. I've made life-changing decisions. I wasn't just exposed to the Bible. Man, I ate this stuff up. It became who I was, and now I'm better for it because I let God deep into my heart. You know, I think about Paul, and he died in old age. He died a martyr, a hero of the faith for centuries of believers to come. And do you know that's who you could be? You could be a legacy of faithfulness for your family heritage. You could be a legacy of faithfulness for for your friends, for your neighborhood, for your work. But you've got to fight the good fight of faith. It's believed that Paul was led by Nero's soldiers out of the city to to the place of execution where he, after his prayers were made, gave his neck to the sword with a full fulfillment that he fought the good fight. Are you fighting the good fight today? Are you deep in the faith today? Maybe you're here today and you say, man, I've been exposed to stuff, but I don't really know if I'm in this fight right now. I want to challenge you to study the Bible. Be a man or woman who decides to respond today and and have the guts to go up who ever invited you out and say, man, you know what? I want to jump in one of those Bible studies. I want to get on my adventure with God in a great way. And you know what's going to happen is God, along the way, God will show you who you really are. And if you have the guts to really see it, you see who your mom told you you were, your dad or your teacher, your coach. I mean, maybe they saw characteristics of you, but, but unless the Bible got deep into your life and you were guided with that, you're never really going to know who you are. And if you'll study the Bible and, 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 and you'll let it into your life, you'll find out who God made you to be. And you'll get on your adventure with God. And maybe you're here today and, and you started your adventure at some point, but maybe it doesn't feel like such an adventure anymore. <laughs> maybe it can feel like duties. Or maybe it can feel like you're going through the motions. I want to challenge you to decide who you want to be. Who do you want to be at the end of today? I'm on, don't you want your head to hit the pillow and say, man, I left it out all out on the field today. I don't know about you guys, after this week that goes by, I want to finish this week and look back on this week and say, man, I left it all out on the field this week. And ultimately, we want to look back on our lives and say, you know what? Even though it was tough at times, we left it all out on the field. The wounds we got that were, they were wounds at times, but man, they're scars now. And these scars tell stories. I mean, Jesus on the cross, wasn't he wounded? After the resurrection, wasn't he showing his scars? I mean, that's who God wants you and me to be. But we got to get into the fight and we got to decide we're going to be men and women who fight the good fight of faith. Amen. Let's go over to Ezekiel chapter 14. Ezekiel chapter 14. We got to look at the Old Testament today as well. Amen, guys. We are a Bible church. We believe that that all scriptures God breathed. And uh, we don't believe we're under the law anymore. We believe we're under grace. Amen for that. Um, But we believe the principles of the Bible are still applicable today. And one of the things that I I got a great piece of insight on, which I can share it another time, but um, it was in the earlier, I'll, I'll share it today. Amen. Our second point today as we go to Ezekiel chapter 14 is, Identify your idols and smash them. You know, they've got these new uh, things I see on, uh, on Groupon nowadays. And um, every now and then I'll go on Groupon and see what's going on, you know. And uh, we, do a, we do a family time once a week with our family. Ideally once a week. And uh, sometimes I look on Groupon and I'll just type in things to do. And, you know, people are always looking for things to do. If you know great things to do, I mean, you, that, that's a good opportunity for you to make some great money. Um, but people are looking for things to do, so I type that in, and, and there's this, there's, you know, there's, sh- there's like shooting ranges, there's like bow and arrow type of stuff, there's like horseback riding, but there's these places called smash houses. Yeah. You ever heard of those? A, a smash house is basically like, it's this place where you go, I think it's by weight, so like you can buy a certain like amount of junk like you could say like hey people bring it to a dump yard but people have like put a building around it and you walk in and you get a baseball bat and I think you get it like you measure it by weight all the places are different but like say I want this uh, TV that 
four, you know, 60 inch over there that it's old. It's like one of those big ones, you know, it's like, it's not a flat one, you know, it's like thick, you know what I mean? Or like, yeah, or like a box TV or like a box computer. And, and they give you a baseball bat and you go into this place and you just get to wail on this stuff and people pay money for it. I almost paid money. I didn't go do it, but I was like, man, that'd be a lot of fun. And it feels, I mean, I think there's just something about just like smashing something that just, it lets something out. You know, I think about my son, I want to put uh, our three-year-old in T-ball, you know, I want him just to be able to smash that ball, you know. I think it's something that comes out of you that's, it pulls the best out of you, you know. And, and I believe spiritually, the best comes out of us when we smash any type of idols in our life. What is an idol? An idol is like, it's sin. If, if some sort of sin creeps into your life, you, you smash it and you smash it quickly. Because the longer it lives there, what happens is it, it, it kicks its feet up a little bit, you know. And then it puts its arms out and then it calls its buddy to come on over. And, and then before you know it, there's a fellowship party of sin in your heart. And, and then all of a sudden you're like, oh, they live here too. They're just next door, you know. And that's a terrible thing for, for somebody who's trying to have a relationship with God because God has no relationship with sin. And so people are like, man, I wish I was closer to God. And I wish I just felt more connected to God. And well, the question comes is, have you let some sort of idol creep into your life? Let's look here at what God thinks about idols in Ezekiel chapter 14. Some of the elders of Israel came to me and sat down in front of me. Then the word of the Lord came to me, son of man, these men have set up idols in their hearts and put wicked stumbling blocks before their faces. Should I let them inquire of me at all? Therefore speak to them and tell them. This is what the sovereign Lord says. When an Israelite sets up idols in his heart and puts a wicked stumbling block before his face and then goes to a prophet, I, the Lord, will answer myself in keeping with his great idolatry. I will do this to recapture the hearts of the people of Israel who have all deserted me for their idols. Therefore say to the house of Israel, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Repent. Turn from your idols and renounce all your detestable practices. When an Israelite or any alien lives in Israel, separates himself from me, and sets up idols in his heart and puts a wicked stumbling block before his face, and then goes to a prophet to inquire of me, I, the Lord, will answer him myself. I will set my face against that man and make him an example and a byword. And I love this passage because it can seem intense. I mean... It could seem like God's mad. You ever read the Bible? I'm like, man, God's mad. God can be provoked. God is, is compassionate and God is loving. But in order to be loving and compassionate, you have to care about something. You know, the Bible says that as Christians, we're supposed to hate evil. Most people say they're Christian. They don't hate anything. They're like, love, 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 love. Oh, yeah, love, love, love. Oh, let's all coexist, and, and Jesus didn't judge anybody, and, and it's true. We don't, we don't want to be judgmental, but, but we've got to have a standard if we're going to bear the name of Christian. I mean, after all, if you're going to be a Christian, you've got to be Christ-like. If you're going to be a disciple of Jesus, you've got to be a student who's following Jesus. And here was, here was God, and God was angry. God was hurt. God was bothered. And why was it? It was because God had chosen these people. He had called them by name. I believe if you're here today, God is calling you by name. If you're listening to this, God is calling you by name. And God, he wants to put his affection on you. And God wants to build with you. And, and God's just a, a father who wants to lavish all his love on you as a child. He's like, man, I want, to, I want you to have this. And I, I want to teach you this lesson. And yeah, it's gonna, we're going to go through some discipline. And some of us, it's, it's tough to accept the discipline of God because we didn't really have discipline from a parental figure growing up. And maybe you're here today and, and you went through some situations and you were supposed to go through these different stages of life where you were a young child and then you learned how to deal with responsibility. But some of us just got accelerated to responsibility. And you just started doing things your way and, and it's put a callus over your heart. And, and you're here today and you're like, man, I want to love God, but, but I also want to protect myself. And what God is saying is that God wants, he wants to be generous. He wants to, you're beloved to him. 
And the, and the people had set up idols in their hearts for different reasons, because they weren't getting satisfaction from something, because they wanted more, they wanted something else, they wanted pleasure. An idol could be anything. It doesn't have to be a little funky thing that sits on a, a table. An idol can be a relationship. It's anything you put above God. An idol can be yourself. An idol can be a, a job. It can be, school can even be an idol. A sport could be an idol. Good things can become idols if we make them more important than God in our lives. And what had happened was the people started these detestable practices. And what did it mean? It meant that the idols became more important than their God. And we live in a world that has been drowned in idolatry. You talk to the average person today and find out what's the most important. And it's probably something about finances. It's probably something about popularity. It's probably something about fitting in. It's probably something about, about something on this earth. And idolatry has, has come in and tried to baptize the world. And what we're doing and what God wants to do is God wants to go into a world that's, I mean, God looked at all of Israel and said, man, everybody's gone into their idolatry. And God said, I got to go and recapture the hearts of my people. And that's the loving God. And maybe you're here today and something's crept into your life. And, and maybe something's become more important than God in your life today. Today can be the day that you respond. And you let God recapture your heart. And you get back to that childlike stage that says, God, I want to learn about you. I want to know you deeper. I want to find out who you want me to be. And I'm willing to change it. Even if it causes my life to get on pause for a little bit. You're worth it, God. And you just take that bat out, spiritually speaking, and you just start smashing that idol in your life. And you say, get the impurity out of my life, the pornography, get the hatred out of my life. I want to get the criticism out of my life, the resentment. I want to get the apathy out of my life. I've been there, guys. Anybody lived resentful before? Man, I've lived resentful before. It is exhausting. It's exhausting. Remember there was a time that, that something had happened to me that I just didn't feel like was fair. You ever been there before? <laughs> Man, that, that can creep in. It's just, why me? And, and, that, and then you start, because you had so much fellowship with that situation, which is hard to swallow at first. It was like, man, I, I thought I was loving God, but I was, because that situation changed, my joy got robbed. So really, where, where was I rejoicing? And God's like, man, I want to recapture your heart. So I, I, I want you to go through this kind of time of, of, of fighting and persevering and idol smashing because it's going to pay so many dividends in the end. And I, I, I put all my hope in something and maybe it wasn't even all my hope. It's just a lot of my hope, you know, because faith is delicate. Hope is delicate. Our hearts are delicate. They're powerful, but they're delicate. And what happened was I started finding myself having a lot of fellowship with my resentment. And fellowship with resentment can start to, it's like at first it's, it's wrong, but then it can kind of be like something you look forward to. I mean, I, there were times I would wake up and I would just be thinking about the situation I was resentful about. And, and, and then I, you know, you ever been to that place where even like sometimes you picture yourself like confronting the situation and like... <laughs> And like, there's like a group of people around and like, and you just win the situation, you know? And you're like, and I hope you learn the lesson. And you're like, glory to God, you know? Man, that's a, guys, that's a, it's real, but it's, it's, a, it's a dark fellowship. Because the, the challenge is, is that God doesn't have your heart at that time. I believe God's wrestling because he, he's like, man, I want to recapture your heart. I, I, I mean, this is God. God's the, the hero who wants to come in. And he, he's like, if it's tug of war, I mean, God's going to win. Every time God's going to win. But you're kind of deciding, like, which way am I going to get tugged harder? And if you smash the idolatry and you just let go of that other hand and hold on to God, God's going to pull you along the way. And eventually he's going to get his arm around you and he's going to just kind of carry you along the way. But you and me got to stay in that fellowship. You know, uh, if you haven't smashed some sort of an idol in your life, I want to give you the liberty to do it. 
And maybe you're here today and you don't know how to do it. I want to give you a little bit of a process how to do it. Does that sound good? Okay. The first thing you got to do is, let me tell you what idols hate. Idols hate being exposed. Idols love to live in the mind. They love to live in the heart. They love to live behind closed doors. Idols love to have that kind of a fellowship. So the first thing that you got to do is you got to expose whatever that idol is. I want to give you a great passage to read. It's Psalm 51. I read through Psalm 51, and you know, the crazy thing is, is when you got resentment or you got idolatry or any kind of, I mean, any kind of idol that you set up. It could be an impurity. It could be something that you have that you keep in the darkness that's a part of you that's not a part of God. That's the separation. That's the stumbling block that will make you trip every single time until you deal with it. So the first thing you got to do, I, I highly recommend you read Psalm 51. And David says, my sin is always before me. You know what the problem is when you protect your idol? Somebody else's sin is always before you. Because when you have fellowship with your idol, you want to justify yourself and why you're doing what you're doing because somebody else did something. And so David, one of the greatest men of God of, our, uh, of, of all time, he says, my sin is always before me. And David said, you know what? I'm going to own who I am because, God, I want the joy of your salvation back in my life. I want to give everybody the permission to expose your idols, even though if they hate it, and maybe you feel like you don't want to expose it. Let me tell you, that's because the idolatry has tricked you. And let me tell you, once an idol's exposed, healing starts to become quick. People start, God starts sending people in your life. God starts sending the right scriptures in your life. God starts lifting the load off your shoulders. You start to get free, and you start to get more free, and vision comes back into your life. Fellowship creeps back into your life. Waking up's easier. Going to bed is even more righteous, and you get to just enjoy your life in a greater way. And then people see that, and you become more effective in your life. You know, once you expose it, you got to get strong people in your life who are going to help you. If you're visiting today, we're a church that believes that nobody's better than anybody else. We believe that Jesus is the king, and we're all a bunch of beggars who found some bread, some spiritual bread. And God told us how to live, and some of us are doing well in other areas or this area, and, and we learned how to get through this, so we want to help you get through that. And nobody's better than anybody else. We just want to help each other become great for God. And then once we do that, you can decide to repent at a heart level, because there's going to be a moment where you're going to wonder, should I go back to that? And at a heart level, when you decide you're done with it, you're back in the fight of faith. And when you do that, you walk with God and God gives you the strength to be the man or the woman that God's called you to be. My challenge is simple. Expose any idol that's crept into your life, no matter how ugly it is. And I'll tell you, when my resentment was here, and it was here, it felt justified, and it felt clean, and it felt, it felt powerful. But it, it made you weak spiritually. And when you're able to get that from here to here, and you're able to just kind of pull it out and look at it, it's like, oh, that was inside of me. That is disgusting. And then you want to expose it because you've seen it. And you're moved by it. And you want to say, man, this was inside of me. Can you help me never get this stuff back inside of me again? What scriptures help you? I want this. This is a scripture that's helped me. And you know what? You're going to meet somebody probably that same week, probably that month, probably not too far down the road and say, man, I'm really struggling with this. And you're going to say, you know what? Let me tell you how to deal with it. And you're going to be able to help somebody else. You're going to be like Jesus in that sense because you exposed and smashed the idols in your life. Our last point today is God's plan is for you to stand. You know, oftentimes I, I meet people, and I can be guilty of this, is just, and a lot of people just don't believe that God has great plans for their life. That maybe because you didn't get the love that you needed growing up, or maybe you've been crossed by, by a, a childhood friend, or maybe something's happened in your life that, that you've started to view God as, God just wants me to get in line and just be disciplined and, and just do my best, and then that's the fellowship that God wants to have with me. No, God wants you to stand, and God wants to stand with you. God wants to have fellowship with you, and God wants to do the mission together. God wants, you to, God wants to be there when you get raised up to, to lead something. If you're single, God wants to be there when you get a girlfriend or a boyfriend. God wants to be there right next to you when you get engaged. And, 
and, you're, and you, you have a pure lifestyle. God wants to be there when you get married. God wants to be there when you're at your job and you're talking to your boss. And God wants to have a great fellowship with you. And we got to believe that about God, guys. God is not some distant boss in the, the far you know, corner looking for somebody who's going to make a mistake. God's like, I know all you guys are making mistakes. I just want to recapture your hearts so we could do this thing together. Let's close out here in Hebrews chapter 10. In Hebrews chapter 10, it's one of those scriptures that scares me but fires me up, and I hope it does the same for you this morning. In Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 32, God's plan is for you to stand. Verse 32, it says, Remember those earlier days after you had received the light, when you stood your ground in a great contest in the face of suffering. Doesn't that sound like a fight right there? You stood your ground. You ever back down from a situation and just been like, man, I should have stood my ground in that situation. It's like, man, you're like, you know what? I'm going to go out today and I'm going to share my faith with 10 people. And you go out and you're like, oh, that guy's busy. That guy doesn't look like he really wants to hear the message today. That guy's on the phone and, oh, that guy's probably getting ready for a meeting. I probably shouldn't, shouldn't talk to them or, oh, that, they got their kids. I don't, I don't want to bother them. They're probably, and, and you're going out, you're going to stand your ground. You're like, man, I'm a revolutionary. I'm going to go change the world. I'm going to motivate the world to follow Jesus today and because that's my calling. And then you go out and you're like, well, I'll just get a coffee and <laughs> have another prayer. You know what I mean? We are the ones, guys, who get to stand our ground. We get to go out into this great contest. Doesn't it sound like a fight? I mean, it's a battle, isn't it? It's a great contest. This is the greatest contest of our entire lives. That work responsibility you have, it's, it's great. But that's not the greatest contest of your life. That promotion you want to get, or please, go get that promotion. and be. I believe disciples should be in the running for every promotion at their work. I believe if you're a student, you should be knocking out your tests as students. You should be going to your classes. And you should be on time to your classes. And you should be doing your homework. But that's not the greatest contest of your life. The greatest contest is to continue to bear the name of Christ and to continue to walk this incredible life of faith. It says in the face of suffering, it means that you and suffering can get right here at times. And you're just not going to give up. You're going to say, man, I used to have a No Fear shirt. You guys remember that brand, No Fear? It's uh, for those who might not. Is, uh, it would have this like intense statement. It was like, he who dies with the most toys still dies. No fear. But there was, a, there was another one. It says, it, I held on to it for a long time. It says, wherever the fear may be, look it in the eyes. No fear. And I just think, I mean, we get to be face to face with suffering. And sometimes when we see hardship come into our lives, we want to act like it's not there. We want to say, man, if, maybe if I just don't look at it, it'll go away, you know. Maybe if I just go get my nails done again, or maybe if I, for the sisters, you know, maybe if I go just get that new haircut, Kenny. I just, you know, maybe if I just... But it's a great contest. And I do want to share, I'm so proud of, of, I mean, to be a part of this church. I'm so proud of the campus ministry. I'm so proud of, I'm proud of, of the men who are raising up. You know, I think about our brother Zeno. And Zeno's an awesome brother. Zeno is, he's in a contest. Um, Zeno's got a, I mean, Zeno, some days he walks an hour to work. Early, early in the morning. Zeno is like, he constantly fights to get a job to where he can, he can pay his bills and then he can be available as much as he can to be in Bible studies and really build the ministry. And Zeno goes and he, he'll sweat at a grill all day and he'll leave his work and he's sweating in Texas, you know, like all of us are in Texas. But a lot of us work in the AC, you know, Zeno, he's, and then he's like in Bible studies and he's working with brothers and he's, he's fighting to build his character and He's filming stuff, and he's putting together promotional videos, and constantly brothers are so grateful for him and sharing about him for good news. And Zeno, bro, you're in the contest, and I appreciate you fighting and suffering in a great way. 
I think about our, our brother Gavin. Gavin's an awesome brother. I mean, Gavin is, Gavin, now, he's got Bella, so that helps him out a lot, you know what I mean? Gavin's, Gavin's credit rating goes like way up when you see Bella, you know? But Gavin, I mean, Gavin, not only does he do like 700 pound farmer carries, you know, on his, on his off time, I mean, Gavin is, he's in Bible studies, Gavin's leading the teens with, uh, with Bella, I mean, with Bella, they're doing an awesome job, he's figuring out how to put together campus events, he's, he's fighting for souls, bro, it's an honor to be side by side with you in this battle. I think of our brother KJ, Kyoja. Kyoja, I mean, he's the, he's the president of the club on campus, he's... He's worked at the same job for years and years, and he's been promoted because he's responsible. And he still finds time to be an excellent student, just to see his family out last week. I mean, his impact on his family. He's leading a Bible talk. He's fighting to be in Bible studies and mentor people. KJ, it's an honor to be in the contest with you, my brother. And I could go on with so many people. The last person I want to share about is Kenny. And uh, I appreciate Kenny. Guys, Kenny works through the night. He just makes it happen. He, fight, he leads Bible talks. He's in Bible studies. I asked him the other day, I, hey, what do you got going on today? He's like, man, I got a Bible study, and I'm going to work through the night. Like, Bro, this is awesome. And he, he does it so that he can be available to be in this fight more and more often. You know, for you, how's the contest going? Is it great in your life? Is the battle raging in your life? Do you have somebody you're fighting for? What if everybody here said, I'm going to find one person this week, and I'm going to fight for somebody this week? I'm going to be sending them scriptures. I'm going to find out a time that we can get together and study the Bible. I'm going to be praying for them. Maybe I'm going to dedicate a day to fasting for this person. I'm in the fight. I mean, with a church of almost 150 people, could you imagine if everybody was fighting for somebody? And 150 people were being prayed for this week and sending scriptures. You know how much faith would be in Arlington and Fort Worth and and Dallas this week, it would just be a matter of time before it starts permeating all throughout Dallas-Fort Worth. Well, let's keep reading in verse 33 as we come in for a close. It says, sometimes you were publicly exposed to insult and persecution. At other times, you stood side by side with those who were so treated. You sympathized with those in prison and joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property because you knew that you, you yourselves had better and lasting possessions. So do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere so that you do not have, when you have done the will of God, you will receive what has been promised for in just a very little while. He who is coming will come and not delay. But my righteous one will live by faith. And if he shrinks back, I will not be pleased with him. But we are not of those who shrink back in Dallas Fort Worth. Amen? Amen. We are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed. But of those who believe and are saved. You know, it's amazing as these disciples were looking back on their life and they said, man, we stood our ground. We continued to fight. Yes, we went through some hardships and we were publicly exposed and publicly persecuted. And maybe you read this and you said, man, I've never been through something like that. Well, that's okay. You've been through some hardship. You ever been in a conversation that was really difficult and you got the courage up to go be in that conversation and you gave your entire heart? You're in the battle in that sense. You ever gone out to share your faith with somebody and felt intimidated, but you just decided to do it anyway? And maybe just said a prayer, God, please move my heart to not be fearful. And you just went and you did it? You're in the contest. You ever been there before where maybe you seen somebody living a certain way and you knew it wasn't right, but, but you weren't sure about how it would go if you said something and you just denied yourself and you went in love and you shared something and you opened the Bible and God smoothed out the situation? You're in the great contest. And the challenge for us, if you're here today, is I want to challenge you to get into this contest. Maybe you haven't studied the Bible. Make a decision to study the Bible today. Get on your adventure. Get inside of the Bible, and the Bible will get inside of you and change you from the inside. And God can change your life as soon as today. I want to close out with a well-known passage from a movie in Rocky Five. You got Rocky and he's talking to his son and I like to picture this as God talking to you and me today. And so as I read this, don't picture Rocky talking to his son. 
Picture your father in heaven having a one-on-one -on -one talk with you this morning. It says, when things get hard, you started looking for someone to blame, my son. Like a big shadow. Let me tell you something you already know. The world ain't sunshine and rainbows. It's a very mean and nasty place, and I don't care how tough you are. It will beat you to your knees and keep you there permanently if you let it. You, me, or nobody's going to hit as hard as life. But it ain't about how hard you get, you get hit. It's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. How much you can take and keep moving forward. That's how winning is done. Now, if you know what you're worth, and all of us are worth the blood of Jesus because he died for each and every one of us. If you know what you're worth, then go out and get what you're worth. But you got to be willing to take the hits and not pointing fingers saying you ain't where you want to be because of him or her or anybody. Cowards do that, and that ain't you. That ain't us in the Dallas-Fort Worth church. You're better than that. I'm always going to love you no matter what. No matter what happens. You're my son. You're my daughter. You're my blood. You're the best thing in my life. But until you start believing in yourself, you ain't going to have a life. It's amazing that this speech got him the courage up to go and do something that he couldn't do before. And I believe in the same way when, when God has our hearts and we allow God to speak to our hearts and we respond and you can respond today. And you let God recapture your heart and, and you smash the idols in your life. And you realize that God's plan is for you to stand. You can look at Jesus because that's the one we serve at the end of the day. And that's the one that we follow here in Dallas, Fort Worth. He was the greatest leader to walk the face of the earth. He was the most courageous. He had no hired servants. Yet they called him master. No degree, yet they called him teacher. He had no medicines, yet they called him healer. He had no army, yet kings feared him. He won no military battles, yet he conquered the world. He committed no crime, yet they crucified him. And he showed his love for us because of the cross and said, you and me, we can fight through anything as long as we got God and we got each other and we got his word. Let's go get into the good fight this week and to God be all the glory. Yeah.